Today, uh, we take up uh, the topic of World War I, the First World War, the Great War, and the home front. And I think that this is a particularly important lecture, and the information is important. I'm going to suggest through this lecture and through the segments how, in fundamental ways, the experience of the United States in the First World War set the stage for future events in the United States. I tend to see this point in time, really about you know, 1917, 1920, as one of those points, though I hesitate to use the term, which you could easily refer to as a sort of watershed period. And I, I say that for a number of reasons that I hope will become apparent uh, as I go through the material. And as always, I'm not asking that you necessarily buy my argument, that you accept it, um, but I am asking that you consider it and think about as we move forward in time and we cover more of the 20th century in this survey, that you consider the ramifications of what we'll talk about here in, in this very lecture. Well, on April the 2nd, 1917, um, Woodrow Wilson appeared before Congress and made a speech calling for U.S. entry into the war that was then raging in Europe. Melanie Story, uh, for you all, will, you, you'll know that uh, she's done quite a bit in terms of talking about the war uh, as it was fought in Europe and then U.S. participation in it. And she'll also be uh, providing a subsequent lecture dealing with the post-war and the securing of the peace or the failure in Woodrow Wilson's case to secure the peace that he wanted. And what impacts post-World War I will be felt in the United States? Well, this lecture, of course, is more about the home front, but there'll be some overlap here. So Woodrow Wilson appears before Congress and he makes a, a statement that becomes extraordinarily well known. He says that the world must be made safe for democracy. Arguably, this sentence, this sentiment is sort of a rhetorical flourish because we know that there were commercial interests at stake and principles of international law revolving around trade and neutral nations engaging with belligerent nations or nations involved in warfare. For this lecture, though, I'd like to move to another quote because Congress does, a few days after Wilson appears, Congress does um, vote for taking America into the First World War. And Wilson has another quote in which he says this, quote, it is not an army that we must shape and train for war, it is a nation. Now what that quote means is, to me anyway, that Wilson very much recognizes that this war is going to require of the United States not merely soldiers in the field, but a coordinated and committed effort to support the United States military. An effort that will require all of the resources, that will require all of the focus and commitment that the United States citizens can provide. That means workers in industry who are not called up to fight. But it also means mothers and women in the home who are going to be asked to conserve resources that may be needed for the war effort. One of the phrases or terms that you often hear tossed around of course, is total war. Well, I don't know if that applies here or not. I don't know if this is total war, but it is more, I think, than Americans, by and large, most Americans, let's put it that way, have been asked to give in terms of commitment to a national goal, like winning a war. <laughs> 
virtually all aspects of American society, of U.S. production capacity, will at some level be touched, called upon by the war effort. I mentioned industry. American industry will, as it would during World War II, be a huge part of what the United States brings to this war effort. But there's another side to this, which arguably is more social and cultural, and that has to do with the mindset of American citizens. It's not enough. It's not enough just to have people work. Instead, what Wilson is calling for and what his government will work toward will be a level of commitment to the goals set by the nation that will allow citizens to sacrifice for the goal, that will bind up individual behavior with sort of um, national goals through what we might call patriotism. During the war, one of the phrases, one of the terms that is used quite often, though it becomes a little stale as the war progresses, this term is 100% Americanism. And what's meant by that is a level of commitment to these goals. It is, it is patriotism writ large. The other major point I'd like to make at this point, and something that you should kind of watch for as we move through this material, is the degree to which the government or the state will assume responsibility for this total mobilization. Mobilization just means, of course, getting all, everything ready for war, mobilizing your resources, bringing them together, coordinating them so that you know, you're, you're, you're moving for success. It's not a new, new idea, of course, but mobilization for war and the government's role, the great coordinator, if you will. And what I'd like to argue, and as always, you know, you're welcome to disagree, but what I'd like to argue and I'd like to have you listen for are the indications that the structures, the mechanisms, the tools or instruments that government will use to oversee this war effort, this massive mobilization, are instruments that harken back to progressive ideas. It has to do with the influence of progressive thought. And let me remind you very quickly that Woodrow Wilson comes to the presidency through the 1912 election running as a progressive candidate. And let me remind you too that part of the progressive program, part of the progressive activity had entailed utilizing government to promote reform. Really in ways that perhaps government had never functioned before in the United States. So at a minimum, I would suggest progressive, progressivism sets the stage for how the Wilson government approaches the business of mobilization here. Now, I want to go back in time just a bit and suggest to you that as early as 1915, the United States had begun preparing for war. Wilson could not have sat by idly, even as, even as he kept arguing that the United States would seek to remain out of the war and seek to remain neutral. He couldn't have helped observing how the war was going, especially in the trenches of the Western Front in Europe. He could not have helped, I think, seeing the degree to which the fighting itself required nations to really mobilize their resources in ways that they really hadn't in times past, certainly 
I would argue, since the very early 19th century. There hadn't been a war like the Great War, like World War I, in a long time in Europe. There were voices of dissent long before 1917, voices that for a variety of reasons sought to keep the United States neutral and out of the fighting. There were feminists. There were individuals uh, like Carrie Chapman Catt, long associated with the suffrage battles, who could argue quite effectively that the problem, the threat of America going to war was a product of politics and the old male traditional domination of politics, but more importantly that war was simply a bad idea and that the votes of women might forestall it. There were socialists like Eugene Debs who spoke out against the war. Another figure that we'll talk more about here in just a little bit, another segment really is Big Bill Haywood. Um, and labor. There were voices, particularly in the labor movement in the United States, that opposed the war, like the socialists often because they saw the interests of nationalism, the interests of the nation, as secondary to the interests of labor and to class, like the working class. And so they saw the war itself as the product of a corrupt really capitalist system. In other words, the wealthy were gaining from the war, but it would be the working classes that experienced the death and destruction on a mass scale. And you could see that unfolding in the trenches of Europe. There were also old imperialists. Remember, there had been voices of dissent during the Spanish-American War that had vociferously rejected the idea of American expansion for all sorts of reasons, some racial reasons, others business reasons. People like Andrew Carnegie, uh, Henry Ford, for a variety of reasons, Ford, we'll talk more about him in a bit, but also voices like the voice of William Jennings Bryan. Bryan, you recall, had run against McKinley and the key issue in the campaign had been imperialism. So, and let me add too real quick that uh, while I'm not going to talk about it here, Brian, as early as 1915, had actually left Woodrow Wilson's cabinet, had resigned in protest really over what he saw as a move or generally a, a mood moving the country toward entry into World War I. He stood on principle, though he was a longtime Democrat and sort of social justice advocate. He, he stood on principle and resigned from the cabinet. So there were a number of voices to be heard. And yet the United States continued 1914, 15, 16, and into 1917 continued to move toward war. In the next segment, I want to talk about the impacts of war, and then we'll talk about the structures, the instruments that the federal government used to coordinate this notion of total war. And then finally, in the last segment, I want to talk some about the civil rights implications that accompanied the United States entry into the war and this notion of 100% Americanism. <laughs> 